planning on time traveling, are you? I see you've got the dial set here to 70 million years before the present. That'll be an interesting trip, I can assure you. But I suggest that you keep your distance from the forest edge. You'll find that terrible things lurk there. Gigantic, hungry things that draw slow, hissing gulps of air. If you have the patience, and if you wait at a safe distance, you'll see explosions of teeth and jaws erupt from darkness like shellfire. You'll see fangs sink into the backs and tails of fleeing dinosaurs. You'll see hides opened, muscles torn, and organs devoured. As surreal as it sounds, it is plain fact that for many millions of years on our spinning, terraqueous globe, death by Tyrannosaur was quite an ordinary way to go. These days, Tyrannosaurs are difficult to find. Hiking through outcrops in Montana or the Dakotas, where ancient mounds project like ruins from the Great Plains, you might walk past parts of a hundred Triceratops, horns, toes, teeth, without seeing a single one of its enemies. But when you're alone with your thoughts in the swaying prairie, no matter where your mind may wander, it never strays too far from the beast, from the hope of finding one in the wild, a rex in the rough, a tooth or limb crumbling out of some forlorn mound. But there is a place where tyrannosaurs are not the exception, a place where mazes of sandstone bring you face to face with one of nature's grandest inventions. These dinosaurs sleep not in the prairie of Montana cattle ranches, but in the land of Genghis Khan, the vast deserts of Central Asia. While their fossils may have been known to wanderers for thousands of years, inspiring legends of griffins that guard mountains of gold, science only met the dinosaurs of Mongolia in the 1920s, when an American adventurer led an epic series of expeditions into that world of wind and dust. There is no similar area of the inhabited Earth about which so little is known, wrote Roy Chapman Andrews of the American Museum of Natural History. <laughs> With Andrews at the helm, Camel caravans and primitive cars cruised through the blank spaces on the map to find the so-called missing link between humans and apes. It was not yet known that it was Africa, not Asia, from which our curious species emerged. Still, these sojourners returned to their homes as heroes, for they brought back stories, films, and bones from the most surreal graveyards on Earth. They found outstanding quantities of pristine dinosaur skeletons, all of them never before seen species. They found oblong stones with strange textures, and in a moment that may have bordered on the transcendent, realized that they were cradling the first dinosaur eggs ever identified. All the while, fed up with centuries of Chinese oppression, Mongolia began warming up to Russian influence. During the 1930 expedition, the Americans saw the husks of torched villages filled with bodies, and heard that even one of Andrews' friends had been assassinated. Mongolia had become an exceedingly good place to leave, said Andrews. From then on, outsiders would be treated with the utmost suspicion, and the treasure fields of the Gobi Desert became inaccessible. In 1941, a message arrived at the Russian Academy of Sciences. The Mongolian government wanted Soviet scientists to make some explorations of their own. But these preparations were thwarted by a small historical wrinkle. After the war, a leader was selected in the stout Ivan Efremov, known to some as a paleontologist and to countless more as a best-selling science fiction writer. And there's perhaps no better fodder for science fiction than the land to which they were headed. The Gobi's endless vistas whistled with the wind of a dead planet. Dust storms screamed with Martian vigor. Mongolia was two and a half times the size of France, but fewer than a million people lived beneath its wide skies. To some especially remote, yurt-dwelling nomads, the herd of trucks appeared like terrifying and mysterious beasts in the haze. They made it farther than Andrews ever could, and found what paleontologist Mike Novacek described as the broiling, isolated depression known as the Nemegd Valley. By the time they had finished with it, it would be known to the locals and to the world as the Valley of the Dragons. The Nemegd sediments, it was found, preserved remains of a vast river delta where streams carved channels through forest and plain, inviting gigantic 10-ton herbivores. 
By the end of their third expedition in 1949, Efremov's teams had filled 460 crates with 120 tons of bones. Their bounty was loaded into rail cars on the Trans-Siberian Railway, bound for Moscow. 20 years before, Andrews' team had introduced to the world the lithe Velociraptor and the hollow, otherworldly skeleton of the Oviraptor, leaving Western scientists to wonder what else was hiding in those forbidden seas of sand. From Ulan Batar, the payload crossed through almost 4,000 miles of icy forests and lonely mountains, the furthest any of the extinct passengers had traveled in 70 million years. In 1955, Dinosaur expert Evgeny Malayev published a report called Giant Carnivorous Dinosaurs of Mongolia. While few experts outside of Russia could read the Cyrillic report, the drawings were worth a million words. Here was a huge skull, four foot long according to the scale bar, and a spitting image of Tyrannosaurus rex. Their similarity was enough to summon a phantom bridge from the depths of the sea. That lost link between the old world and new was trodden by dinosaurs long before the peopling of the Americas began in the forgotten ice fields of history. The huge skull offered a chilling confirmation that both continents were play pits for one of the most feared silhouettes in history. For countless animals unfortunate enough to be born into the same slice of space and time, in Asia or North America, their final vision in life was that sardonic, fang-filled grin. Malayev did not consider his fossil to be Tyrannosaurus rex proper. He placed it in the genus Tyrannosaurus, but gave it a distinct second, or species name, calling it Tyrannosaurus batar, batar being the misspelled Mongolian word for hero. Tyrannosaurus batar. Doesn't quite roll off the tongue in the same way. To me at least, it seems strange to hear anything other than Rex come after Tyrannosaurus. A bit like hearing Genghis Changhatai, the Mongolian word for baby, instead of Genghis Khan. At this time, there were only a few decent T-Rex specimens in existence, all of them found in the western US. One housed in Pittsburgh, and one in Manhattan, where the only complete skull lived at the American Museum of Natural History. But by the 1950s, all of a sudden the Russian Academy of Sciences, which previously had almost no dinosaur collection to speak of, boasted an incredible amount of material, including several well-preserved tyrannosaurs with a series of beautiful skulls. It had taken half a century prior to come up with the planet's supply of tyrannosaurids, including T-Rex, Gorgosaurus, and Albertosaurus from the US and Canada. The Soviets matched this in just a few seasons. Malayev was a bit trigger-happy, though. Out of this tyrannosaur collection, he saw four species, where now we just see one. Because the skulls varied greatly in size and slightly in shape, he assumed that each size class was a species all of its own. One of his colleagues corrected this mistake, pointing out that the differences were all to do with age, the smallest skull being the youngest, the largest, the oldest, an interpretation that Malayev eventually accepted. Some now consider the Mongolian Tyrannosaur different enough from T-Rex to deserve the distinct first name Tarbosaurus, which translates to alarming reptile. We'll refer to it as Tarbosaurus Batar, or T-Batar for simplicity's sake. Tarbosaurus was Malayev's darling. He studied it incessantly for years, even made casts of the cavities in the skull so as to examine its brain shape, writing that the plaster mold of Tarbosaurus cranial cavity is morphologically hardly distinguishable from that of Tyrannosaurus rex. As a kid, I saw drawings of Tarbosaur skulls in my dinosaur books, drawings that I now recognize to be figures taken from Malayev's papers, and I remember straining to visually discern the difference between it and T-Rex. After working through the original literature, I found that even for the experts, the differences between them are somewhat trifling. To the casual observer, the most obvious is in their size, while the largest tarbosaurs, like Malayev's huge four-foot skull, approach the size of some T-Rex specimens, they tend to be less massive. The lengthiest T-Rex known are about 42 feet long or so, and estimated to weigh about 8.4 metric tons, or 18,500 pounds, while Tarbosaurus is closer to 30 or so feet, and 5 metric tons, or 11,000 pounds, a much leaner build. The remaining anatomical distinctions between them are very real, but very esoteric. Suffice it to say that T. batar's teeth are thinner and smaller relative to T. rex, that its snout is narrower, skull lighter, and that the roughened, horn-like knobs above the eyes were not as well developed. 
and those tiny arms for which T-Rex is famous are, in Tarbosaurus, tinier still. Overall, they're more alike than different, and would have seemed like doppelgangers. Had Malayev's big Tarbosaur skull been found in Montana or South Dakota, few would have suspected it to be anything but a T-Rex. Paleontologist Greg Paul once went as far as to write that Tarbosaurus may have been a quote, interbreeding geographical subspecies of T-Rex, much as the Eurasian brown bear and American grizzly are subspecies of Ursus arctus. Of course, we may never know if the two were interfertile, but the fact that they occur on different continents means that they were effectively reproductively isolated. Their habitat supported different prey species too, another selection factor. Asia was home to long-necked titanosaurs like Nemegtosaurus, bizarre and gigantic feathered Therizinosaurus and Dinochirus. Conversely, titanosaurs were much rarer in most of T-Rex's range, and there didn't seem to be any of those pot-bellied monstrosities from the Nemect. In their place were huge populations of dangerous, well-defended Triceratops, while in Asia, large horned Ceratopsians were either non-existent or extremely rare. Tyrannosaurus and Tarbosaurus lived among and hunted duck-billed dinosaurs, like Edmontosaurus or Saurolophus, and both had to contend with grumpy, armor-plated ankylosaurs. It's uncertain if or exactly how long the two species overlapped in time. We know that T-Rex lived from about 68 to 66 million years ago, right up until the final extinction of the dinosaurs. But the precise age of the Nemeg formation is unknown, because no well-defined ash layers, which provide the data for acquiring precise ages, have been identified. By correlating the fossils found within the Nemeg to those of other formations for which solid dates are known, geologists have suggested that the world of Tarbosaurus is, as stated, about 70 million years old. A series of hugely successful Polish expeditions in the 60s and 70s, under the direction of Zofia Jaworowska, procured several remarkable Tarbosaurs. Perhaps a bit jealous of their success, another wave of Russian scientists made collections from the Gobi in the 70s. By 1990, the deterioration of the Soviet Union had opened the country up to explorers from the West. Many Tarbosaurs have been found since, including this picturesque skeleton of a three-year-old juvenile. Traces of live Tarbosaurs are known too. While one of the toes in this cast appears to have eroded away, the intact toes are tipped by impressions of its big claws. And, miraculously, a pebbly texture behind the toes is what remains of its fossil skin. In fact, several Tarbosaurs have been found with some impressions of soft tissue. One specimen, sadly ravaged by fossil poachers, preserved little patches of skin, probably from the torso. One expert records that paleontologist Konstantin Mikhailov saw, quote, impressions of skin around a badly weathered skull of Tyrannosaurus batar that showed the presence of a wattle or bag of skin under the jaws, unquote. There is a certain segment of humanity, myself among them, that have been waiting at the edge of their chair for many years in hopes of hearing the headline, Big Carnivorous Dinosaur Mummy Found, Skin of Face Preserved. Unfortunately, probably due to its poor state of preservation, the skull with the skin from the jaws was not collected, and no photographs of it seem to exist. Still we sit, hoping that one day, the odds of erosion and decay will have been beaten at least once. When dinosaur skeletons began to be strung up in the Soviet Union, Russian artists, who have remained in relative obscurity, stepped in to animate them. Among the greats was Konstantin Konstantinovich Fliorov. If he disliked someone, a colleague once wrote of him, he would disregard all acceptable behavior. He was as vindictive as an elephant, and in the heat of the moment he was as invincible as a bison during the rut. Fliorov was not tyrannized by his own scientific background. He avoided scientific literalism, wrote a colleague. Something else was more important for him. These were not lifelike renditions of prehistoric animals, but fever dreams, splendid deliriums, populated by dinosaurs. His landscapes swirl and pulse on the canvas like someone had given Van Gogh a time machine. When they're set at dusk, his primordial skies burn with dust, set at night, and they shine with a ghostly luminescence. A 1955 painting, produced when Malayev first published a description of Tarbosaurus, may be the first depiction of the animal. Following Fliorov's death, the State Orlov Museum in Moscow commissioned a pair of artists to create a 28-meter-long fresco, which they named Late Cretaceous Landscape of the South Gobi, completed in 1986. It depicts the haze of a sunset universe, where unfamiliar reptiles preside over swamp and jungle. 
On the far left, a spindle-armed tarbosaur peels from the trees to stalk the lumbering bathers. Over a thousand chicken yolks were sacrificed to produce this celestial dream. It was a post-nuclear world, the tensest decades in history, but on both sides of the Iron Curtain, artists reveled in the mystery of vanished worlds, and children craned their necks upward with wonder and delight at towering skeletons and magnificent murals of lost worlds. If you see a sandy brown bone of a velociraptor, Sorolophus, or Tarbosaurus for sale, you're looking at a smuggled object. Fossil poaching in the Gobi has been disastrous for science. Expert Phil Curry claims to have found almost a hundred poached skeletons of Tarbosaurus alone in the field since 2000. What would have been a promising quarry is reduced to fossil rubble. Bones are ripped from the ground without care, jaws hammered apart to extract lucrative teeth. So when a 24-foot skeleton of a subadult Tarbosaur was lined up for auction in New York City in 2012, paleontologists worked to salvage it from disappearing into a private collection. Mongolian paleontologist Bolor Minjin, longtime U.S. resident, overheard a news report about the auction. Um, it's hard to imagine anything larger than this beast over here, because look at the skull alone. The skull alone is about... You know, she wrote to Heritage long. Auctions that, quote, the auctioning of such specimens fuels the illegal fossil trade and must be stopped. Word began to spread in the scientific community, and a petition to prevent the sale gathered thousands of signatures. Min Jin's letter was answered by Heritage Auctions attorney, who wrote that no impropriety exists, and with a line that made paleontologists don a collective cringe, went on to say that, quote, Mongolia won its independence in 1921, and this specimen is quite a bit older than that. The sale went through for $1,052,500. But when Homeland Security appeared, the company changed its tune. Well, good morning, and signed by new, as they say in Mongolian. I am John Morton, the director of U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Today we do something extraordinary. We return to the people of Mongolia a 70 million year old dinosaur that was looted from the rocky sands of the Gobi Desert. The Tyrannosaur was seized by the U.S. government, as was a Tarbosaur skull that actor Nicolas Cage had bought from the same dealer. The Tarbosaur was repatriated to Mongolia and then mounted for display. Within a year, it had been seen by 750,000 Mongolians. The people of Mongolia could rightfully see the lifeless bones of their reptilian hero. But the children and dreamers among them saw more than bone. They caught mental glimpses of the world it lived in, the turtles and crocodiles ambling through the mud, the rivers gushing over soggy banks, and those dark forests where immense shadow beings stare with an ancient patience to which only the harvesters of living flesh abide, where saliva drips at the clueless approach of a naive herbivore.